I've just built another one of these lovely OLED screen Game Boy Color consoles. There is a lot of love for this mod, but sadly there's not a lot of love for these things. There are so many upgrades that you can get now for your original Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket, Color, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP, but many of these kits involve soldering one, maybe two wires in order to either get it working, as is the case with the OLED Game Boy Color, or in some cases to add a little bit more functionality like using the brightness button on the Game Boy Advance SP. Now I've done plenty of tutorials for all of these different kits, but the question that always comes up tends to be about the soldering. So the thing that puts a lot of people off with these mods is adding that wire. Soldering involves adding wires or connecting components together by melting a small amount of metal called solder onto the connections, which holds them in place and allows electricity to flow through the joint. It seems very technical. It looks like it might be quite fiddly, but really it's quite an accessible skill that's quite easy to learn, provided you are patient and careful. So in this video, I slowed down quite a bit when it came to adding the wire on this build to explain to you how you can learn this technique. Okay, so I've got myself another of these awesome OLED display kits for Game Boy Color. I've got a donor console that was faulty. I've spent a bit of time fixing that up. I've got a shell. This time, rather than just buy the basic one with the black buttons, I've bought the white shell, which comes with the white silicon pads and a set of matching white buttons. It cost a little bit more. Now, last time when I did this, I kept all of the original buttons and membranes. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build it with all of the stock parts that come with the kit and do a little bit of a comparison with those. But the main thing I want to focus on in this video is the bit that seems to put so many people off. In order to get this screen actually working on your Game Boy, it involves adding a wire and that wire needs to be soldered in place, which is really easy to do, but I understand it puts a lot of people off. Any process that comes up where you're modifying a Game Boy, a drop-in solution without any cutting, without any soldering is always what will appeal. But in the case of this screen, I know lots of people want to do the OLED mod, and if the soldering is putting you off, my main focus of this video is to show you that it really isn't anything much to worry about. When you are installing the screen, you attach with a variety of ribbons, but there is also a single wire which connects to your Game Boy Color motherboard and also to the PCB that is attached to the screen that will provide power to the screen. Without that, the screen kit won't work. So if you want the OLED upgrade, you have to add that wire. If that is putting you off, I want this video to be something that just puts your mind at ease when it comes to that. Now, in terms of equipment that you use, I am currently using this Miniware TS-80P soldering iron. It was quite expensive and it's only because I do a lot of soldering that I invested in this. I certainly wouldn't say something like this is essential for a beginner. This is powered by USB-C. There is a little socket on the back you need a 12 volt 30 watt input to go in there and then you can actually just solder. So I find this really handy out in my shed because I can just get a USB cable, plug it into my USB battery pack thing and uh, away I go. But as I say, it's expensive and if you're a beginner or if you're only soldering like for this one thing, then you might want something a bit cheaper. So this wire here is solder, specifically soft solder. The thinner the wire you can get, the easier it is to melt it onto a surface, particularly if you're doing delicate work. But the advantage of this stuff is that, well, two advantages, it has a low melting point. So when it melts onto electronic components, it doesn't have to get up to a temperature that's gonna damage those components. And secondly, it is a fantastic electrical conductor. So if you think of it like a hot glue gun, if you understand hot glue guns, if you've used those before, the plastic strip of glue goes into the gun it's fed through and heated up and the liquid glue comes out the end the liquid blob envelops whatever it is you're trying to stick together and when it cools it holds it in place and solder does kind of the same thing you will have two wires two components a component going through a circuit board with a copper pad basically two metal surfaces you want to connect you heat those up because this stuff will only stick to hot metal. A common misconception is that a soldering iron is for melting the solder. It's not, it's for heating up the metal that you are trying to solder onto. And then when that solder melts and then cools, it holds the metal parts in place 
and it allows electricity to pass between the two. But the bit that obviously is the initial stumbling block for people who haven't soldered before is equipment, is, is what to actually use. So I've got a range of three different uh, soldering irons to show you. I've got my Miniware TS80P. I've got a cheap cordless soldering iron that I picked up recently from Aldi. And I've got my trusty mains powered Antex CS18. So all three of these will do the same job. All three of these have interchangeable tips. You can change the shape of the end of your soldering iron. If you're doing things like Game Boy mods and stuff like that, a pointed tip is generally the easiest one to use. But if you've got a different shape like this one here, that's not the end of the world, okay? So you can still do the same jobs. It's more about planning how you're actually working and working efficiently. Not necessarily rushing it, but being quick and efficient with what you're doing. In the case of all of these, what happens is that it switches on and the metal part gets hot. The tip in particular get very, very hot. You do not want to be touching that. You know, that can get up to like 350 degrees. You don't want to be touching that. But the plastic handle is safe to use. And for years, I used this cheap, budget 18 watt Antex soldering iron with no problems at all. So if you're new to soldering, I would totally recommend something like this. You just basically the controls are as simple as it can get. You plug it in and it gets hot. Now you don't want to be touching that so you need to keep that safe. So something like a stand is very important. You wouldn't just like leave it on the desk like that. Particularly you don't want to knock it into your lap or anything that would just be terrifying. Um, most stands have like a little sprung coil to allow for a little flexibility but also the heat is focused around here. So a lot if that was spread out, that would be a longer piece, so it would cool down as it gets towards the base. There is usually a sponge involved. That sponge needs to be damp, and it is just to wipe off and clean the tip of the soldering iron. You can also get a tip cleaner with these sort of brass shavings. The solder basically sticks to these, so if you've got any excess solder on your tip of your iron and it's heated up, you just sort of jab it in there, and it removes the excess solder from that tip. So this is the stand for my Antex iron, and it just sort of sits in there like that while it's not in use, and you get that out when you're going to use it. Now I'm not using that one today. The cordless soldering iron came with a stand as well and I made a little thing for the sponge. So again the sponge needs to be damp when you're using it and when you're not using the iron it just sits in the holder. In terms of equipment if you have a soldering iron then you are going to be able to do any of these sort of jobs. A lower wattage iron is normally better for these delicate jobs but even with a higher wattage one you just need to work fairly swiftly and not leave any heat on any surface purposes for too long. I've also got this little portable engineer stand. You can see that I have had a mishap on there with my iron, so do be careful. This is a cool little portable one that splits into two parts. So it's got the sponge in there. It's got a rubber seal where you put the lid on so the sponge stays damp, which is handy because I've no tap out here in the shed. And then that bit just folds up for the iron to rest on. So this is quite a handy little setup for me. And you can just leave that over in the corner of your workspace and it's all set and ready to go. In in terms of plugging it in, I've got a nice bright yellow IKEA USB cable that will plug in there. And then the other end is going to plug into my USB battery pack when I need it. So of course we are going to need a donor Game Boy to actually use the motherboard and install into all this setup. I've got the buttons and the silicon membranes, which I am quite curious to try out and compare with the OG buttons. I've got the shell and I've got the screen kit. Now the screen kit is where the soldering comes in. So we'll just pop this open. Now I am not going to go into loads of detail on the full install because I've got a whole other video that, that goes through all that process. But in the kit, you get this PCB, you get the screen itself, which has another PCB attached to it. And you get three wires, although you're only actually going to need to solder one. I'm not sure why there's three. You get an insulating strip and you get some capped on tape as well, which will come in handy in a bit. So the screen has the other PCB that attaches to it. Last time I did the video, I attached this first and then did my soldering. But really, I think I don't want to be getting too much heat near it. I was working quite quickly. So for me, doing that wasn't much of an issue. But if you're new to soldering, you'll be much safer doing this before you attach it to the screen. So the screen itself is just going to go to one side and we are going to focus on this bit here. So our first soldering job is going to be attaching to where it says bat on here. There is 
already a pre-soldered point. Now this is what we call tinned and the same goes for the wire. The wire is already stripped and tinned at the end. Now if this wasn't the case and your wire just starts out like this, what you would do is you would strip the end. Now I buy wire that's got really soft rubber on it so you can just strip it really easily with your thumbnail but if you're not doing that you can just gently pinch with some wire strippers and strip that off but the difference here is that this wire is tinned which means it has some solder melted onto it already this wire currently isn't so what you would need to do let's just get some helping hands here is you would just get your wire what we are going to need to do is heat up the wire and add a little bit of solder now this gets me onto the subject of flux a lot of people seem to think flux is like this this magic substance that's going to solve all of your problems the fact is most solder wire when you get it has a core of flux running along it all flux is is it is a substance that allows your solder to flow more easily and adhere to the metal a little bit more effectively you can get it in like a, a paste in a, a syringe like this uh, you can even get it in a pen and you just sort of draw it onto the surface but the one i prefer is a liquid flux and it just kind of has a brush built into the lid and you just sort of brush it slightly on there. Now the downside of flux is as it burns up and does clean that surface, it makes a bit of a mess over a circuit board. So sometimes you'll need alcohol uh, like this, isopropyl alcohol or something like that to clean up the surface afterwards. Anyway, my soldering iron is now heated up and I will just prepare this by tinning it. I'm not obviously using this wire, this is just an example here. So the process of soldering, first of all, my tip is a little bit blackened. You do get a little bit of buildup of deposit, so I'm just gonna wipe that off on my damp sponge and uh, make sure that that is all clean before I start. So that comes up really nice and shiny on the tip. And then I am just kind of going to heat up the wire, add a little solder, and then allow it to flow, okay? So there are three steps involved. I'm gonna do the same at the other end of the wire and go through those three steps again because it is really, really important that you get these things done in the right order. I've seen a lot of videos where people will kind of get some solder onto their soldering iron and then hold the wire and bring it over and just try and put the solder on. If you remember that the solder sticks to hot metal, then the rest of the logic of the process will make sense. So I've just put a little bit of flux on there, but again, not really necessary. If you haven't got that, it will still work fine. As I say, most solder has flux in its core. So you have your soldering iron, you have whatever it is you're soldering, and you have your solder. Okay, so soldering iron and solder. Just in terms of the process, knowing the names of the parts, helps with understanding what you're doing. So the solder will only stick to hot metal. The wire is what we need to get hot. Throughout the whole process, the iron, the soldering iron, stays on the metal parts. The solder itself only visits briefly. That's kind of in the middle. The third step, which is where you allow it to flow, is the important one that a lot of people will miss out. You don't move both of these away at the same time, you leave the iron on. So we heat it, we add a little solder, we allow it to flow, and we move away. There will be fumes coming off there, either have an extractor or just keep clear or work in a well ventilated area. So that's tinning. And with this particular kit, the part that we need to solder to, the battery is already tinned. There's already a little blob of solder in place on there. You can remove the ribbon if you don't want to get too close to that with your soldering iron. You can just use a spudger or a fingernail or whatever else to lever up this little catch here and then the ribbon will come out and then that's safely out of the way while you're doing your soldering. The thing about soldering efficiently, and it is about efficiency, it's not about speed as in rushing, is that you want to plan ahead, make sure everything is in place before you solder and then work quickly with what you are doing. So I've got my wire that I want to attach to my battery connector here. And what I want to do is make sure everything is ready. I've already got solder on the surface of the board. I've already got solder on here. Just to make things a little easier and make sure everything flows okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of flux on the end here and a little bit of flux on the contact point where it's got the battery. But again, if you don't have that, 
it should still work. You just need to be patient with what you're doing. I'll wipe off the tip of my iron and then I'll pick up my wire. I am now ready to go. So my process is, in this case, because I've already tinned those surfaces, because I've already got some solder on both of those surfaces, all I need to do is if I've got one bit of solder and another bit of solder and I rest them together and then I reheat, those will merge into one blob and then I let that cool and you've got a really sturdy joint. So that's what's happening in this case here. We've got it away from the screen, we've got it away from the ribbon, we've got it away from as many delicate components as we can because again if you're new to soldering you want to be very careful. One of the things to watch out for is if you're looking so much at the point where you're soldering keep an eye on the rest of the metal part of your iron as well because you don't want that to accidentally touch any of these other bits or particularly rest on any plastic parts. So part of your planning is the angle that you're going at. I'm left-handed so I'm going to hold my soldering iron. Notice I'm holding it not like that, I'm holding it like I would hold a, a pen. It gives me a bit more control over, over what I'm doing. I'm coming in from the left so I'll position the circuit board so that I can get to that point without the risk of, of coming in contact with any of these other components on the board. Similarly, my other hand is coming in from the other direction and rather than putting it just here, there or anywhere, I wanna come in from an angle where the wire isn't likely to end up rooted across any other components. So now we've been through all that, we are ready to solder. The process is we are gonna line up the wire with the point here and I'm going to just heat that surface there and the wire will go into the center of that blob and I'll move away. Like I say, you work quickly. It's not so much that you're rushing it. It's just that it takes a short amount of time for the solder to melt. You put that in place, you hold it steady, and then I can put the iron to one side for now because that will be used on the other end of the wire to attach something to the motherboard of the Game Boy later. But that is now soldered and in place. And a gentle tug there, obviously not pulling it but a gentle tug just to make sure it's in place that is all now fine and ready for me to reassemble and start getting in place with the screen so with that part lifted up my ribbon goes in place here that part flips back down and grips it in position i've got my tray there which will just help to keep everything sturdy this is the latest version of my uh, game boy color build tray I'm just going to pop that off there i'm going to take off the self-adhesive strips and I'm going to actually position this screen in the shell straight away. So it starts at the bottom because you've got like this excess screen down here. Just in on an angle, push it around and get that in nice and firm at the top and all the way around. Make sure that that's in position. That's my screen in place on my shell. Now I can get to the inside and there is this little tab that lifts up here. That goes over and attaches onto this part here. So that just sort of feeds through that hole. This little ribbon here flips over and clips in place there. Don't want to bend any pins. There we go. And that just clips in place there. Our wire, our red wire, goes straight up that way there. That's going to come up and over onto our Game Boy. And we also need to mask off this area, which is what this insulating film is for. To allow a little bit more movement of the ribbon, I cut this down to size rather than use like the whole piece. It won't stick super firmly in place but it doesn't have to really it doesn't matter it's just a barrier in between the two surfaces also i've got my buttons this time i am going to be using the replacement ones and seeing how they go now last time it had a um clear well partly clear infrared cover this one looks like a solid plastic so i might keep the one out of my original anyway so i've got my game boy it's tested and it's working, the screen is very scratched. It needed a lot of repairs inside, but they are all done now. Fortunately, the infrared cover is in pretty good shape, so I'm gonna swap that one out. Now I've got my motherboard, which is ready to go in place. Get my silicon pads on here as well. So that will slide in place up here here just sit in there like that now before you actually attach the motherboard i find it easier rather than put it i've seen people put it in place and then struggle to get this ribbon over you don't have to struggle because you can just position your motherboard a little further down get a lot more room to move your ribbon into position make sure that's in the right spot and then pinch those little clamps down make sure they're right down on both sides also make sure that your new wire 
is up there. Get your switch moved down to the off position. With that in position, I am going to end up doing some more soldering, but it's easier to do it with everything in place. So I'm going to use the three screws. Again, if we are going to be working efficiently before we even start, we need to think about what we are doing. Now, the bit we need to solder to is the other end of the wire goes on these. This is where you're getting in to a little bit more of an awkward area. You've got four connectors in a row along here, mark three, two, C and one. And C is the point we want to connect to. It does help to, although there is already solder on that surface, I've repaired this switch recently, so that's quite fresh solder, but your switch may be in its original form from when it was first attached to your Game Boy in 1998. So that solder's been there a while. It might be worth adding a little bit more. So again, it's about tinning those surfaces. The end of your wire is already tinned. You could cut it shorter so you don't have the excess wire in there, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Just leave it as is, it's fine. There's plenty of room to route the wire where you need it. So if we are going to tin this surface again, you can do this without flux, but if you have flux, then this is the point where you would use it. I'll just put some onto that surface. One of the advantages of flux is that it allows the separate parts of solder to flow. So if you've got bits that are quite close together here, it's quite handy for separating. Now you'll notice I've rotated the whole setup here uh, because I'm trying to work out what's the best angle for me to get at when I'm coming in with my soldering iron. So my soldering iron is here. I, I don't want to run the risk of like resting on the cartridge slot or anything like that. I've got to be careful of these uh, little chips that are nearby. But also I want to be able to get in at the right angle with my wire. So first of all, I am positioning my work. That is going to be the easiest way for me to get in with my soldering iron. But I'm temporarily going to put that back on its stand. Now I know that my circuit board is in the right spot, it's lined up correctly. Getting the wire in would be a little awkward for that. Because I've got a row of four, I want the wire to come in from, from this angle. So I am going to bend the wire and spend some time getting it so that I can hold it easily and line it up easily in the right spot there to handle that comfortably while I'm doing the soldering. It might even help to point it downwards slightly towards that point. So that's okay there. It would be fine because mine has got fresh solder on this point, but just to talk to you about tinning that surface again, don't forget solder will only stick to hot metal and it's that one, two, three process of just gently, and it is tricky to line up. It's the C point that you're looking for there. And you've got to work, the whole thing happens quite quickly, but again, you're not rushing it. It's just thinking ahead to what you're doing and then doing it. So one, I'm gonna heat the pad. Two, I'm gonna add some solder. Three, I'm gonna let it flow, and then I'll just move away and let it cool. So, one, heat it. Two, add some solder. Three, let it flow or move away. Now there is a fresh blob of solder on that surface. You could add a little bit more flux at this point if you want to, you know, you know, if you weren't sure about it flowing, but now it's the same sort of process as we were doing before. I'm gonna heat that blob, bring the tip of this wire into the center of that blob, move the heat away and give that time to cool. You wanna hold fairly close, so you've got a lot of control over what you're doing, but you don't wanna get so close that your fingers are at risk of getting burned. Heat the blob. Allow the wire to just merge with it. Make sure it's in the right position. And then move the iron away while it cools. Again, a gentle tug just to check everything is okay. Now it has worked and it is secured in place. It doesn't look like a very tidy joint. So I might show you how to desolder and resolder if it is something that is, is bothering you. So in this case, it is held securely but it's not that neat. So what I could do is desolder it. And to desolder, all you do is be ready on the wire to move it out of the way, heat the point that you are soldering to, and move it away. And then what I'm gonna to do to resolder to try and get it to flow a bit better is just pop a little bit of liquid flux on the surface and on the tip of the wire as well. And then my process of soldering is exactly the same as it was before. I'll just make sure my wire is at the right angle. Clean the tip of my iron. Heat the blob. Allow my wire to merge with it. 
and then move away. And this time it's flowed into a much neater blob. I'm much happier with that. And it's given me the opportunity to show you how to desolder something as well. Now I can move my work around here. When I'm putting this back together, I don't want to end up risking this wire pinching. So what I did last time, and I think I'll do the same this time as well, is I'm just going to root the wire all around this space here, just so that it's not resting on top of any components. And the kit does come with some capped on tape, which is like a, a heat resistant and electrically non-conductive tape. You get like little strips like this. Just position that there. Make sure my wire isn't on any components there. And that just helps your newly soldered wire behave. And also means that if you get any strain on it at any point, it's going to be subjected to this area and not where the switch is connected. With that done now, I think we are ready to put our back plate on here. Let's just give that a quick test. Comes on and seems to be working pretty well. The buttons look nice, don't they? With everything all in white there. Our soldering has clearly worked because we are getting power to our screen. And we'll just do a quick test on our touch screen. It will remember those settings. The switch feels okay. It's not particularly clicky. But normally, like when I've done these before and I've used the third party buttons, the problem with the switch is that it's a little bit too big for the opening and it, it gets stuck. This feels quite nice and smooth. And here we are. We've got our brand new OLED Game Boy. And it was pretty easy to do, wasn't it? You know, there was soldering involved, but just that one wire. And again, it's about taking your time and being patient with what you're doing. It's about just knowing and understanding what you're going to do before you do it. Yes, I use quite an expensive soldering iron, but don't forget for years I've used a cheap mains powered iron that has done the job perfectly fine. So don't let the cost put you off. Don't feel like you have to get really expensive equipment. If someone you know has a soldering iron, you'll probably be able to borrow it and use it unless it's a big high wattage one, which of course you'd want to avoid. So yeah, now we are looking at the buttons. This is the original buttons and the original membranes which were taken out directly from the original Game Boy. So what you'll find is the original membranes tend to be a bit softer, a bit more flexible and the D-pad in particular uh, of the original has a slightly bigger nub in the center there which allows for a bit more of a, a rotational pivot against the circuit board because that bit rests against the PCB. A and B buttons have a slight more curve to them than these high speed Edo ones which are a little bit flatter on the surface but they look neat they look good and the color matches quite nicely with the shell so let's have a quick go right so we'll set a challenge B type so there we go you can see that it just feels absolutely second nature on these buttons. I wasn't even thinking about the buttons or how they felt. The control was there. And then we'll try it with the other buttons as a direct contrast to the uh, original ones. And we'll see how that feels. Same settings. Now, straight away, when I'm, I'm pressing on my uh, A button to go through the menus. The D-pad feels okay, but the A button does take a firmer push than usual. B button feels like more of a gentle squidge, but the A definitely feels more of a firmer press. Let's see how this goes. I'm surprised. I thought the D-pad was going to be the issue, but the D-pad feels really comfortable. It's the A and B that I'm not so sure. Obviously, the start and select I'm definitely going to keep because that's the white. That looks really nice. Oh, I think we're coming a cropper here. Oh, especially with a block. Yeah. So the B slightly less responsive there. So I think what I'm going to do is quickly pop it apart and just swap out the silicon membranes for the A and B. The buttons themselves feel okay, actually. Interestingly, now I've got those other membranes in. Like that felt nice and solid before. But they feel a bit rattly. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm... See, these have a slightly thicker 
membrane, which is probably better suited to those buttons. I'll have a quick play and see how it feels. Straight away, the buttons do feel better. They just, like I say, they just rattle a little in the shell. It, hmm. It feels more responsive, but I don't think I like that rattle. I think what I'd probably be better off doing is put the white silicon pad back in. But I think that these buttons are designed for these membranes, which are slightly thicker. I think what I might be better doing is swap back to this and kind of break them in, because obviously these are new. They might take a little bit of gameplay before they start working well. So I'm gonna just swap them back out again. Interestingly, the sticker on the back of this one is like you'd get on the back of the Pokemon version because it's got the little Game Freak um, copyright on the back as well. But this shell is uh, not Pokemon related. So now that that is back together and we've got that comparison, these buttons feel much more solid. I didn't like the rattle to it, so I think I will prefer just kind of breaking these in a little bit and spending a bit more time playing on them. Again, still works fine. There you go, that's doable with the replacement buttons. That's all right. Do you know what? I really like this in white. It looks really good. So that is it. I have ended up with another gorgeous looking Game Boy and hopefully used that process to enable people to feel like they can tackle the soldering of the wires a little bit more confidently because it really isn't anything to be afraid of. If you want to get into modding and if you want to do a build like this, you can get yourself onto Z Labs. I've got an affiliate link in the description where you can buy these awesome kits. And also you can check out the tools that they've got on there. They've also got a whole range of buttons and membranes and shells in different colors. So you can do your own unique build. I mentioned earlier, I have done a much more in-depth tutorial on how to create one of these OLED Game Boy Colors. I'll leave a link for that one up there if you want to check it out after watching this. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.